The Dharma, incomparably profound and exquisite, is rarely met with even in hundreds of thousands of millions of kalpas. We now can see it, hear it, accept and hold it. May we realize the true mind of the Tathagata. Today is day five of this eight-day session here, Rohatsu, uh, the most intense session of the year in northern New Mexico at Mountain Gate. Actually, it's the most intense session of the year anywhere it's held, anywhere in the world. But um, it's also the case here at Mountain Gate in northern New Mexico. And <clears throat> we will continue sharing uh, the words of Hakuin and, and Hakuin's life, uh, since he is a foremost, uh, well, resurrector of Rinzai Zen. He's a premier example of practice, although, um, to be sure, he, he, because of his dynamic personality, um, he has engaged in some types of practice that were a little bit challenging for most people and, in fact, got him sick. He, he ended up a little bit of a nervous wreck uh, because he was just practicing like this. And that's not as effective as just reaching deep within ourselves as clearly and as concentratedly without the stress element as possible. And, and we can reach the same uh, level of awareness, awakeness, satori, as he did with uh, not the level of side effects that he had. So yesterday we shared his, his story of being at Shoji Rojin's little hermitage up in uh, way, way up in the middle of nowhere in Iyama, Japan, after he had had his first Kensho. And that first Kensho convinced him that, that he was, well, beyond anybody's Kensho uh, reach for 300 years. And he got quite the swollen head about it. That's one thing that a relatively mild Kensho can do is, is unfortunately can increase our, our ego strength rather than diminish it. And um, it's something that makes it even more important to do the post-Kensho or post-Satori practice, what Tore Enji called the advanced practice and the long maturation. The long maturation is the work we do right from the very first moment we've set bottom on the cushion in our first attempt at Zazen. In fact, for many people, it begins before that. We are trying, we, we have some level of insight into our behavior and we're not comfortable with it. Harada Roshi, Harada Shodo Roshi, went to school to become a psychologist because he didn't like his personality. And he thought that the way to deal with that would be to become a psychologist and study psychology, and, and that way he could correct his, his um, whatever he wanted to call them, negative traits. And then, of course, he met uh, Momon Roshi on that bus. He, he didn't met is maybe a strong word. He encountered Momo Roshi on that bus in Kyoto so many years ago when he was still a college student and was so taken by the depth of peace and equanimity that Momo Roshi radiated without a word. Just his very being was something beyond what Haradaroshi had experienced in the, in the realm of human beings, much less the realm of, of Buddhist priests. And he recalled that he grew up 
in a Buddhist temple, and his father was a Buddhist priest. It, he wasn't always a Buddhist priest. In fact, he started his life uh, as part of a, a very wealthy family that had for generations been sake brewers. And then one year, the sake establishment where they were creating the sake burnt down. And this was well in an era before insurance. And so that was the end of the business. And he was by then a young adult and he was casting around to figure out what, what he could do to earn a living after that and uh, decided he would become a fortune teller. There are fortune tellers in Japan. And in fact, um, many of the times when I visited and stayed at Rinzenji in Kyoto, there was a fortune teller that had set up shop right outside the, the front entrance to the temple facing the river. So he was doing his fortune telling and then one day a young woman, the only girl in the family who had been, uh, her father was trying to marry her off to a, an older guy and she wanted nothing to do with this guy. And uh, so she staged a, a hunger strike and the family finally relented and said, okay, uh, all right, you don't need to marry this guy. And so she went to the fortune teller to find out what was next in her life. And they connected and they eventually became the parents of Hara Shodo Roshi and his older brother and his older sister and his younger sisters. There were three or four younger sisters. And then one day, uh, his wife had a dream in the, which she, she saw him as a Buddhist priest. Come, and he was out doing his begging rounds and um, he had on, when you do this, this so-called begging, it's not really begging, it's expressing the Dharma, it's presenting the Dharma. Uh, you have a bag around your neck and on the front of the bag is written, of course, in Japanese characters, the name of the temple that you're associated with. And when you come to a, a home or a business in, as part of your trek in the uh, takuhatsu process, you stand there with your hands palm to palm and you chant what is translated in in into English as Dharma. And you stand there totally engrossed in your practice, chanting. And if somebody comes out and offers something, you hold the bag out for them to receive. So you yourself are not receiving this, this donation, this gift. It is the temple that is receiving it. And then you bow and you chant a, a sutra as a, as a gift to them. This is the Dharma that they're receiving. And then you move on to the next position and do that. And when, when you heard yesterday about Hakuin going out <clears throat> on Takuhatsu and standing in front of the house where the crazy old lady lived, and she was just standing there chanting, and she came out and she didn't want him there. And here and there in Japan, as you're doing takuhatsu, there are people that don't want you there and they'll go like this, which means bug off. It's quite a, an experience. It's a wonderful practice experience going on takuhatsu in Japan. In all manner of seasons, you're doing it. You're, you're sweating incredibly in the heat and the moisture going around in the summer. In the winter, you're freezing because your feet are bare both times. Always, basically, in the temple, your feet are bare. At least when you're on your way to the zendo, in the zendo, uh, in the dining area, uh, actively moving around in the temple or sitting zazen or eating in the, the meals, you are barefoot. 
you can wear your socks while you're in your, your room, yes, but, but the rest of the time, your hands, your feet, and your head are bare. And it can be uh, an experience. We don't have the high altitude sun at Sogenji. Much of the, the cities in Japan are along the, the edge of the sea, not in the mountains. And so you don't have the benefit of that high altitude sun to warm you up. And in the winter, it can be quite a long experience, four or five hours of walking in the ice, an icy wind, and it may be 20 degrees, 14 degrees. I've seen the temperature on the thermometer there, and it's cold. And sometimes you, you have this heartwarming experience of people running up to you and emptying their purses of, uh, well, it's usually their, their change purse, into your bag, and, and you know they don't have a lot of money. Or you're stopping in a house and a two-year-old with his mom comes out and he puts his, his little coins in your, in your bag. And then there are the people that go like this. And then on occasion, you will also meet somebody who is mentally ill. And that also can be an experience. It's like a whole sashimi, each takuhatsu. It, it was an amazing experience to do this. So back to Hakuin, he has been at Shoji Rojin's temple. Shoji Rojin has done everything possible to make him realize that his much vaunted Kensho experience was not uh, the big deal that he took it as and assigned him a number of koans, advanced koans actually. These are, these are among the, uh, the hard to fathom koans. There are certain koans that they're called the nanto koans <coughs> that are difficult to, to fathom. And he was assigned a number of those and, and he was aghast because with that so-called amazing depth of Kensho that he thought he had had, he should have been able to get him like this. And he didn't. And so he applied himself really, really strongly. And as he was out there on Takuhatsu, <coughs> he was totally absorbed in his inner search for the answer. His wordless search, because it has to be wordless. And that's when he was not um, aware that the old lady had said, I don't want you here. And she came out and, and wailed away at him with this broom until he actually fell into the mud. He's fallen into the mud a, mu uh, a fair amount, actually. He falls into it many more times after that, and it doesn't doesn't bother him. And then he went back, and and it was clear that he had actually gone deeper. And then some friends of his, other monks, have come, and apparently they they had also brought news that that his. Um, Parent priest is what it's called in Japan, it was ill, and so it was his responsibility as, as one who had been ordained by this man to go and take care of him as he was ill. And so besides that, these other monks had said to him that if he didn't go back, then they would stay. And he knew that they, they would be a problem for uh, this tiny little temple. They would probably trample the garden, um, camping there, and, and uh, it would be a, a distraction. And apparently he felt that they didn't have the depth of intention to practice that he did. And so he said, okay, I'll go. I'll go back 
to show Angie and take care of uh, my parent priest. And so they left. And we'll, we'll, we'll take up a little bit of that, which we did share yesterday from this book, Wild Ivy, which is the autobiography of Hawkween, and uh, was translated into English by Norman Waddell. Before that, I want to share again something that we already shared because it is so very, very important. And that is what Shoji Rojin said to him. He said, I sincerely hope you live to be my age. You must firmly resolve. You will never be satisfied with trifling gains. Now you must devote your efforts to post-satori training. People who remain satisfied with a small attainment never advance beyond the stage of the Shravakas. Anyone who remains ignorant of the practice that comes after Satori will invariably end up as one of those unfortunate arhats of the lesser vehicle. And then it continues, by post-Satori training he means going forward after your first Satori and devoting yourself to continued practice. And when that practice bears fruit, to continue still further. As you keep on proceeding for, forward, you will arrive at some final difficult barriers. What is required is simply continuous and unremitting devotion to hidden practice, scrupulous application. That is the essence within the essence. What is the essence within the essence? What is the essence within the essence? You've understood to a certain level. What is the essence within that? And then it says, it certainly doesn't mean sneaking off to some mountain and sitting like a block of wood on a rock or under a tree, silently illuminating yourself. It means immersing yourself totally in your practice at all times. And in all your daily activities, walking, standing, sitting, or lying down. Hence, it is said that practice concentrated in activity is a hundred, a thousand, even a million times superior to practice done in a state of inactivity. And so yesterday when we had all those adventures with the delays, with the different malfunctioning pieces of equipment when that ink exploded and, and all the other things that kept us from keeping the regular schedule and, and kept us in, involved in other people who were not part of Sashim for at least part of the time and during our work periods because the construction is still continuing on and naturally we encounter the, the very fine people who are working on this construction. There are not too many of them, just three, but they're beautiful people and in their own way they have done their own style of zazen. And interacting with those people is, is part of our practice when it comes up. We don't go out of our way to do it, but if we're there and they say, hi, how are things, then we respond. Now, there was a sashin many years ago at a place called Grand Lake in Colorado, and, and it was a summer camp. Kathleen Roshi was up there giving sashin. It was, it was rather a much different environment than we were used to, but that's fine. It gives us another opportunity for adjusting to circumstances, being fluid, being flexible, which is part of Zen. And uh, part of the group was housed in a, in a building that was not so close to the Zendo. We had to go through a, on a forest path over to this other building 
And um, in those days, of course, we were cautioned to be absolutely silent. And so people would go back and forth between the two places. And there was a friendly neighbor who would say, hi, how are you doing? What are you guys doing on those brown things that you're wearing? What are you going back and forth for? And everybody's walking silently, stone-faced. And it, it kind of upset the guy. And in fact, it upset him so much that he cut down trees to block the path. And Danon, who was the head monitor at that sashim, had to go talk to him and, and spread a little oil over the roiling of waters. It didn't end up moving the trees, I don't believe, but uh, hopefully it made a difference in this man's life, understanding what was going on. There are other stories, too, about the master who was invited to uh, a dinner at the home of one of the, we call it parishioners of the temple, one of the supporters of the temple, and he went, and he took a young monk as his attendant, and uh, the master was sitting there in the midst of the dinner, enjoying sake, chatting with uh, the hosts, and, and having a wonderful time. The young monk took himself off into a corner and sat Sazen. And on the way home, the master rebuked that young monk. That was not practice. Our Zen practice is about opening up and letting go so completely that whatever circumstances we find ourselves in, we're able to function freely, appropriately. And so we get some practice sometimes, especially here at Mountain Gate, and especially right now while the while the um, construction is continuing. It is good practice. If we depend on going to a quiet place in order to be able to practice, then something is wrong with our practice. We're, we're not doing the practice to the depth that it needs to be done to truly become free. It's lopsided. And then, of course, after having a Kensho experience and another Kensho experience and hopefully many more Kensho experiences, we continue to open, deepen, let go, become more able to flow through life. Upon attaining Satori, if you continue to, vote, to devote yourself to your practice single-mindedly, extracting the poison fangs and talons of the Dharma cave, tearing the vicious life-robbing talisman into shreds, this is Hakuin, combing through texts of all kinds, Buddhists and non-Buddhists alike, accumulating a great store of Dharma wealth, whipping forward the wheel of the four universal vows, pledging yourself to benefit and save all sentient beings while striving every minute of your life to practice the great Dharma giving and having nothing Nothing to do with fame or profit in any shape or form. You will then be a true and legitimate descendant of the Buddha patriarchs. It's a greater reward than gaining rebirth as a human or a god. So, continuing on, um, Ha Queen has has been finally chased down by some of these monks that he had um, been traveling with. And they wanted him to, they either wanted to stay and continue training as he was with Shoju Rojin, or they wanted to travel some more with him. And um, they told him of, of the illness of his parent priest and and which in Japanese terms, it really, in general, it's appropriate. Somebody has been that generous with you and has no other way of being taken care of to, to go and take care of them if they are ill. 
or dying. In this case, this man was elderly. And so he went. And as Hakuin writes, that's the end of this first chapter. Practice is multifaceted. Sitting zazen is important. It forms a basis for our practice. It forms a basis for our ability to do the advanced practice, which is working on advanced koans, and for the long maturation, which is transforming our very being so that it expresses without hindrance the realizations that we gain through our Zen practice and through Satori and Tensho. As we work our way gradually, step by step, towards full awakening. So give yourself deeply to this practice while you've got the chance to do it right now in this concentrated period we call Sashin. And it's guaranteed, if you give yourself that fully, that you will be able to navigate life after Sashin in a much more let go and fluid way. And of course, as Hakui urges, that is not the end of your practice. As we go through life, we encounter situations, we encounter people, things, events, disappointments, upheavals, excitement, all manner of experiences. To use each one of these experiences as a Dharma gate, as a gate to deeper awakening. In this way, not only we're all our practice flourish, but it will be tremendously beneficial towards countless beings, many of whom we may never ever meet. So thank you for listening. We'll stop now and recite the four vows.